every spring, Channel 2 gets a chance to get out of the office and head out road tripping. This year, we decided to get off of the pavement and to head out on the road less traveled. This year, I started the journey off in Southeast. We went on a Jeep safari, took a rugged hike, and learned how some residents in Metlakatla are trying to revive a dying language. Here's how we began our adventure. We're in Ketchikan right now, but our goal is to get to Metlakatla. There's just one small issue. We can only get there by plane or take a boat. 12 minute flight. It's not going to be too long. A little snug for a bit. Here? In the back right there, yep. Okay. One goes either side of it. There are some parts of Alaska so beautiful and remote that most people will never see unless you take a ferry or a 12-minute float plane ride. We leave Ketchikan headed to Metlakatla, passing small islands, ships, rainforests. The day, beautiful and bright, spreads before us, and as we touch down on the other side, we realize this is no ordinary island. <laughs> I see this is what our ancestors made for us. And uh, it's our, our beautiful little part of the world. We learn about Metlakatla, the only Indian reserve in Alaska, from our tour guide and artist, Davy Boxley. He's one of only 1,400 people who live here. He drives us around town, sharing its history and his obvious love for his home. Metlakantla was founded in 1887 uh, by a group of 823 Tsimshian people and their missionary named William Duncan. He came from Beverly, England. William Duncan stayed here for the rest of his life, dying at the home that people made for him. He converted quite a few people and um, they decided to move to a location where uh, he could get them away from the, the potlatching and the influences of the fort. Um, alcohol, um, firearms, uh, disease, all of these things that were all introduced kind of at once for our people. You might have noticed the totem poles we've been passing. Most of these were made by Davy's family. It's a tradition he continued selling ones like this one to Disney or to the galleries in Seattle. The details are incredible and so are the people each one honors people who have been slowly dying over the years, taking with them something irreplaceable. Time to fix this crisis is running out. Shemalagik is a dying language. Uh, we only have five fluent speakers left in our village right now. Only five. And the only ones left are more than 70 years old. The bark has grown back over. Candy McGilton is also an artist. Cedar trees are her medium. It's about finding the right ones. Candy and Davy pull strips like this off the tree. Each one can be no wider than the length of a hand. Right now I'm doing a Z twist and it looks like the top of a Z. So they're going slanted that way. And again, I'm weaving in a clockwise motion. The cedar becomes a basket, but the instructions to make one don't come in English. It takes a lot of practice, but it's also a very beautiful language, and it's part of who I am. It, it's part of my identity, so I think it's very important for me and others to learn our language. Candy and Davy started a nonprofit called the Hayek Foundation, where they're passing on the language and the culture as they learn it from the elders. As cedar becomes a basket, old becomes new, fibers of two worlds woven to create a timeless connection to what was before, is now, and will soon be. I would say that it's the most beautiful place on earth. <laughs> you, can't, you can't go anywhere on this island and not be in awe of its beauty. Few of us locals call it slow dovia. One of the first things you learn when you get to Seldovia is you might as well slow down. Your cell phone probably not going to work. So the best thing to do is kick back and enjoy yourself. There's a lot of uh, wonderful places to hike in uh, the fall. Berries are in abundance. We arrived in Seldovia and quickly learned there was plenty to keep us busy. 
there is a lot of outdoor trails, uh, kayaking, bird watching is fabulous here. You can catch a king salmon off the bridge. But busy isn't what the folks who live here are necessarily looking for. When my husband retired, we wanted to experience a real simpler lifestyle and connect with nature. This is it. Seldovia is a paradise for that. Seldovia was originally settled by Alaska natives. Then it became a port for the Russians who came in search of sea otter pelts. Over the years, the taking of various natural resources has made for a boom and bust economy. Once a thriving port town with seven canneries and up to 3,000 people, today it's a community of less than 500. And it's clear the people who live here love the lifestyle. We're just a small community and try to live like Alaskans are supposed to live, I think. We, we have a lot of fun here. The ocean's right here. What a resource for some, some really healthy foods. Even with the simpler life, Seldovia is looking for growth. But it's a challenge. Our opportunity, our window, is just four months from Memorial Day to Labor Day, where we have a lot of commerce. And so it's hard to attract a business when there's only four months to make a living. We seem to be getting a lot of people that work off computers and they just come here. What a place to have a job like that. So whether it's for work or for play, this small community has a lot to offer. Seldovia is a wonderful place where um, you just feel like you can just lay back and relax. Nobody's in a hurry. That was Tracy Sinclair and photojournalist Leah Schwartz slowing us down in Seldovia. When we come back, we're heading north on a road that is inhospitable for most of the year, but worth it if you can make the drive. You can definitely say this is the road less traveled because for most of the year you can't drive on it. Mike Ross and photojournalist Kim Danke take us down the Petersville Road. It starts in Trapper Creek with a little bit of Alaska history and a few bumps along the way. A road less traveled? Try a road you can barely travel until it thaws and dries out. Wow. The Petersville Road, roughly 34 miles of mostly gravel, some deep mud holes, and spectacular views of Denali. Along with some creek crossings that you might want to think twice about before driving in. Up ahead, the destination for a lot of travelers and treasure seekers, the Petersville Recreational Mining Area. The state has set aside these areas for people who don't have or don't want to claim to just go out and find some gold and, and other stuff. And we got Kurt down here with a three inch dredge. Every summer, gold seekers come here to try their luck and there is gold to be found. So here is some Dutch Hills gold. This is a half ounce and that's a three quarter ounce nugget. So this was just from a, I think a five gallon bucket. I was just messing around, you know. No kidding. Digging around, not gonna tell you where I got it though. <laughs> Gold is the reason the Petersville Road exists. It was discovered here in 1905 and the rush was on. Once they found the gold, how do we get all the supplies up there? How do we do it? Miners blazed a wagon trail through the wilderness, but it was a rugged and sometimes deadly journey. The miners demanded action, and the Alaska Road Commission in the 1920s and 30s built much of the road route we see today. My parents homesteaded just the next homestead down from here. When this he was a kid, best. Ben Porterfield remembers watching old sourdough miners heading down the road each spring. And I'd hear these stories they had about, oh, I'm going to strike it rich this year. And then in the fall, on the way down, they'd stop in again, and they'd be all bearded and uh, tattered and they'd have a little jar of gold and they'd be saying, well, I didn't do too good this year, but next year I know right where to go. <laughs> there is also mystery in these mountains. It's chronicled by the book, The Mystery of the Cash Creek Murders by the late Roberta Sheldon. In 1939, a miner and his wife and a nearby miner and his employee were all murdered on the same day. According to the book, it was the perfect murder because whoever did it got away with it. And we don't know if they got away with all the gold, too. Dennis Garrett owns the land that once belonged to one of the murdered miners, who was rumored to have stashed his gold in a secret hiding place before his death. Sometimes people come up and they ask me about it, and I say, well, I, if I knew where the cache of gold was first, I wouldn't tell you. 